This is a recording of a live Zoom session held by the Seed Library of Los Angeles, Altadena Branch, covering seed saving for tomato seeds, lettuce, and beans. The presentation was given on September 5th, 2020, and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, everyone. And I think for a lot of you, this is your first virtual SLOLA meeting, so we're happy to have you here. And we'll be doing this for the foreseeable future, so glad you can be here with us. And I'm just going to give a little bit of background information as to what the Seed Library of Los Angeles is. Um, refreshers are great. So SLOLA is a not-for-profit local organization based in LA. Um, there are seed libraries all over the country and all over the world, but this particular one is LA based and we are the East Side branch. There's one more in Venice. And the reason that we have two is not only for logistics um, back when we could attend in person, but also because the intention is that the seeds that we're cultivating and saving are, are bioregional specific to our climate. And as we know, our climate here in um, East LA is much different than along the beach. And while we do have lead organizers like Sue, Danielle, Deborah, and myself, and head coordinator Jessica Yarger, we are a collective. And so that means that we're growing with a model that depends on the participation of our community, which is all of you. And um, some of the goals of the Seed Library of Los Angeles is uh, number one, to grow acclimated seeds to our specific bioregion and climate so as to cultivate crops and plants that are more resilient, hardy, and fruitful because they're naturalized to our weather here in the east side. And that process takes about seven seasons. So something that you plant um, now um, in seven years will actually be what we consider um, acclimated to this climate, which is why the seed library is so important. If we're all saving seeds, then we all have access to um, seeds that can tolerate our heat and our drought and um, long summers and things like this. Um, another goal of SLOLA is to build a community of gardeners and people who are interested in food security, habitat restoration and wildlife, as well as a network um, of knowledge and wisdom so that we can cultivate communal resilience for us humans, the legacy of the seeds that we're saving, and the wildlife we cohabitate with. A lot of the seeds that, um, actually most of the seeds that we work with are heirloom seeds, so some of these have been saved um, within cultures, within bioregions, and they all have those stories, so part of our job is to continue, um, continue telling that story. Um, to be a member, um, well, I will first say that um, how SOLO works is that our, our meetings, just like this, are always open to everybody. Anyone can attend and the lectures are free. We do have speakers each month who will share on various topics that we find relevant to this mission. And we also factor in what our members want to learn. And we do pass out, well, we did pass out uh, these information sheets where people could write down topics that they're interested in. I don't know if we'll be doing a digital format version of that. Maybe when you join, you can add that information. Um, to be a member, however, you must live in LA. And that is because of the reasons I explained above. This is a super hyper local bioregional um, seed bank that we're collecting. So if, if you do recruit friends or family that live elsewhere, they're, they're welcome to join um, the meetings, but we wouldn't receive their seeds back because membership is, is just here in LA. To check out seeds, you must be a member. Um, and membership is a simple process. You pay a one-time $10 donation and you'll be invited to check out up to four seed varieties each month. And we use the term check out because the intention is that you'll be returning the seeds that you save to contribute to the evolution of this library. And please do tell your family and friends who are here in LA. Um, the more members that we have who are growing and contributing their saved seeds, the more robust our library is. And we do get many of our seeds from companies like Baker Creek, and we would love to grow other sections of our library like native California plants, flowers, and medicinal and herbal plants as well. 
Um, so there's a lot of room for whatever your specialty in the garden is. And um, seeds would be returned to the library, um, and there are a few criteria that um, we require. The seeds must be open pollinated, organic, and non-GMO. And for varieties that commonly hybridize with other similar plants nearby, such as lettuce, spinach, corn, beets, chard, brassica family, uh, broccoli, cabbage, kale, collards, some melons, etc., you would need to isolate your plant seeds in order to save a true seed for the library. And this is a lot of information for anyone who's new to the seed saving game. So um, take your time and be patient. We can send you information on how to save seeds that I believe are, are um, Sue made for us um, to help give you some more information. And then finally, I wanted to share that um, our, our sister's seed library in Venice is um, based at the Learning Garden, and they are actually in risk of losing that spot. The Learning Garden is um, trying to go away. So uh, Danielle is going to put a link in the chat of how you can sign a petition to keep the Venice Learning Garden and our sister library's location open. Um, I think that's it. So we are going to introduce now Jessica, who's a master gardener and the lead coordinator for our branch. And she's gonna take us through how to save tomato seeds, which I hope you all brought some tomatoes. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, good morning, everybody. I, I see there's a couple questions in the chat just about the intro that I'll um, try to address before I start with my tomato presentation. Um, so somebody's asking about uh, does Slola Altadena include Altadena? Yeah, so it's like LA County at large, not just Los Angeles, the city. Um, so people who live on the west side and in downtown or in other parts closer to Venice may choose to use the Venice branch as their sort of home base in the library. Um, people who more live closer to Pasadena, Highland Park, East LA may choose Altadena as their branch, but you can actually go to either one. Um, membership is, uh, you know, from all the branches. And yeah, so just to reiterate what Gina said, we're, we're asking that membership is, you know, confined to a smaller geographic area to, in order to kind of support the mission of the, the seed library to build a bank of seeds that um, are more adapted to our particular climate. And even the difference between Venice and Altadena is huge. Uh, they're much more of a coastal um, climate and we're definitely an interior valley. So um, yeah, even, even the difference between, even though we're all in LA County, um, there's still huge differences in our growing conditions. Um, so with that, I'm going to get started uh, with our uh, tomato presentation. I'm at the end, so I'm going to do a little talking first and then demonstrate and hopefully you brought your tomatoes with you so you can get started. And then afterward, I'm just gonna talk briefly also about um, lettuce seed and uh, beans, uh, just because I it's the end of the summer and um, they're also fairly easy to start with. Uh, and just to get started, because I know, because typically we're meeting in person and most people live in Pasadena, Altadena, or other parts of Los Angeles in our meetings. And I know today, because we're virtual, we could be coming from a much more uh, wider range. So if in the chat, if you feel comfortable, um, if you could put just generally where you're from, um, if it's a, the city state, and if you're a member or not, just so I get a sense of who's here. The other thing I'm gonna ask is that, or let you know is that we are recording. So if you are not comfortable, um, and we may post this video somewhere for people to access. If you don't want your, your face um, on the screen, you can turn your camera off um, so that you can have that privacy. So, um, okay, I see a lot of people from the LA area, Montana, okay, great. So if you um, do uh, live in the LA area and you do wanna become a member at some point, uh, their link is in the chat. We'll put it in again at the end, and you can always email us too, and we can get you set up that way. Um, great. 
So I'm going to get started. Uh, so tomatoes, I chose, so I want to preface this with sometimes seed saving can feel like this mysterious thing that um, feels like maybe it's hard or complicated. And I used to feel the same way. I, I gardened for decades before I started seed saving. Uh, I just never made the time or it just felt complicated, even though I knew nothing about it. Um, and so if you've been gardening for a long time, great. If you're just starting, that's great too, because seed saving, when it comes down to it, it just takes a little bit of thought and timing. And depending on uh, which crops we're saving seed for is when that thought and timing has to take place. And uh, if you were, have seen my presentation on saving seeds for squash, which I did for the library and for the Master Gardening Program, uh, the beginning of this talk is going to be a little bit of a review. You'll probably recognize some of the slides because I think it's really important to start at the beginning when we're talking about seed saving, and that's with the seed itself. Um, so Gina mentioned in the introduction, she mentioned um, heirloom and open pollinated seeds. And to save seeds and to, and to get a true seed to the parent plant, you have to start with an open pollinated seed as opposed to a hybrid. Um, hybrid seeds um, are um, crop, it's, 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 it's got information. So those plants have more than one parent plant. And it's usually done for reasons to, uh, for virus resistance or other pest resistance. But when that, that plant, when a hybrid plant produces a seed, that seed is less stable, we say. It's an unstable seed and may or may not produce the same plant when you put it in the ground. So the genetic information stored in those seeds could kind of revert back to one or, one or more of the parent plants and not the hybrid plant that you put that you had grown. But an open pollinated seed, um, it has one true parent. And that's also with the caveat that, that the, the variety was pollinated by the same variety. So when we're talking about food crops like tomatoes, tomatoes are all the same species. And then there are different varieties or some people call them cultivars within that species. And all tomatoes can pollinate, I mean, technically, the pollen from a cherry tomato plant can pollinate, you know, a Roma tomato or what any combination of, of um, the varieties. But we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. So, uh, so I'm going to share my screen and we're going to just do a quick review of some plant biology just to, so that the and talk about the process of pollination because it's important to know and understand how it works in general and then how it works specifically for different types of plants um, so that we know that we're getting a true seed when, we, uh, when we're saving them. Okay. All right, so this is a very simple diagram of a flower. And the parts that uh, we are going to focus on are the stamen, okay, and anthers right here. And um, this is the male part of the plant. It is where the pollen is produced and usually is laying on top of the, the anthers right here. The stigma is the female part of the plant, uh, and the pollen lands on the stigma and then travels down into the ovary. This is where the fruit forms so for, for our purposes, the tomato. It'll swell um, and inside are the ovules. Okay, and those are the eggs, which are this become seeds. So in a lot of flowers, we have you know, both male and female parts present um, in, the same, in the same flower. Uh, when we spoke about squash, uh, that's a plant that produces two kinds of flowers. It has male and female flowers. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm pointing to a, a male flower. This flower only has the male parts that produce the pollen, and you can see it's just attached to a long stem. On the left-hand side is the female flower, and this just has the stigma, and now you can see that it's, um, it's attached to, let me get my pointer. 
uh, to the ovule, which is the fruit. In this case, this is a zucchini, and it'll turn and swell um, into a zucchini. So in this case, we rely on insects to transfer the pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers. However, in, in the tomato flower, um, it's one of the flowers that has both the male and female parts. And what's cool about tomatoes is that they are even, they are a self, what we call a self-pollinating plant um, because of, it has both parts and it's also protected. So in the case of the tomato plant, this is a diagram of the tomato, the stigma is what is in most tomatoes, not all of them, but in most tomatoes is retracted. It's inside the flower and the stamen come up around it. If you ever look, you know, if you ever have, you know, look at your flower, there's sort of the part that points out and then the, the petals sort of lay flat. The part that's pointing out is actually the stamen and they're all crowded up around the stigma and they actually create quite a, a seal. So it's, it's kind of sealed in there. The stigma is very protected and the pollen from the stamen just sort of falls inward right onto the, the um, stigma in the tomato flower. In some cases, in some, and you can go out into your garden and look at your tomato flowers and, and observe this, the stigma will be protruding. So it'll be protracted. Um, and in that case, you, we have to be a little bit more careful um, with insect pollination. So for the purposes of saving, saving tomato seeds, unlike the squash, we can be a little bit more relaxed during the pollination time. Um, so because, and that's even more true if the stigma is retracted inside those, um, the stamen and protected because an, a, an insect is not going to get in there most likely and move, you know, get pollen and then travel to another one and get and, and mix up your your, uh, your pollination from one tomato plant to another. Um, so in, in most cases for our home garden purposes, we don't need to protect or isolate the flowers because they do it for us. Um, however, if you do observe that your stigma on your type of uh, tomato is, is sticking out from the stamen, you might wanna take a little extra um, precaution to isolate that flower, especially if you have other tomatoes growing in your garden nearby. And the way you can do that is to bag it. So this is an organza bag, you know, used for party favors or, or whatever. And um, I've actually, in this picture, have put it over a cluster of tomatoes before the, the blooms are open. So you can see you know, there's a, there's a bloom, you know, bud here, and there's, I'm sure there's several more in there. And so I, I bagged the tomato uh, cluster before it opened. And actually, I did this years ago before I knew much about the anatomy of tomato flowers. And I don't know, these could be retracted stigma as well. Um, and you could, you can do it anyway, just to be 100% sure. Um, that you're getting an isolated flower so that the pollen from that plant is the one pollinating your, your tomato. So um, if you are isolating with a bag, um, you wanna make sure that once, once the fruit sets, you have to remove the bag because those tomatoes are gonna get big. Um, you have to remember which ones you isolated. <laughs> and the way I do that is um, I take the, I'm gonna stop my share. I, I take the little plastic ties from the bread bags and I just hook them on the stems right where those, those fruit were so that as they grow through the season, I, I know and when it comes to taking them for harvesting, those are the ones that the seeds I isolated. So if you're a real stickler and you wanna just make sure that you're getting a 100% true seed, you can bag all your tomato blossoms. However, it's not necessary, especially for home gardeners, um, for the flowers that produce the retracted stigma. Um, because they're a self-pollinator, that stigma is pretty protected in there and not so many um, 
in, our pollinators can even get inside of those flowers. You will see um, bumblebees sometimes love our, you, know, you might see them on your tomato plants. And they're, they, um, when they land on the blossoms, they're not getting inside. They're, they, their vibrations shake the pollen out of the little hole um, onto themselves. And, um, and then they might travel. So if, if you see a bumblebee, it's not a huge concern um, because they're not really getting inside. They're shaking the, the pollen out of the flower onto them. Um, but again, if you really wanna be sure, or if you're you know, like a commercial grower, you probably would have to make, you know, take those extra steps. Um, let me just make sure I got everything. So for, for seed saving purposes, this is a self-pollinating plant. Uh, it's one of the easier ones to get started because we don't have to really, really be super careful during the pollination process, unlike the squash. The squash is where you had to take time during the bloom and the fruit set and really kind of be vigilant at that point. But for tomatoes, you can kind of just let them do their thing and then, um, you know, let the fruit grow and not have to worry about cross the cross pollination. Um, I'm going to take any questions at this point before I move on. Um, does anybody uh, want to read them out to me? If there are any, you guys, if you have questions, put them in the chat, um, and I can answer any up to this point. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to just keep going. Um, if you have uh, your tomatoes with you, oh, any particular cultivars need to be bagged. I don't know um, particular like names or what kinds. Uh, I would just say go and look. I looked at all my tomato flowers this year and none of them had the, the, pro, the, the protracted stigma. They all were the stigmas inside. Um, so I, you should be able to see it poking out. So I would just suggest when your tomatoes are blooming, just go take a quick look. Um, because I don't, I don't know particular cultivars or varieties offhand. Um, and then someone said, can winter squash pollinate a summer squash and vice versa? Yes, if they're of the same uh, species. There are four generally four species of squash that we grow in our gardens and then you know hundreds of or about thousands of cultivars within those four uh, species. We call them subspecies I guess uh, and that's true for tomatoes. I mean there are thousands of varieties of tomatoes all the same species but because they have that protected flower we don't worry as much of, uh, uh, for the, the cross pollination. Uh, is the squash class available to view? We're working on that. <laughs> um, so this is only our second uh, virtual meeting. So if you are on our mailing list, um, we'll be sending that out, um, you know, once we get it figured out. Um, and if you wanna be on our mailing list, you can just send, shoot us an email and let us know. And at the end, we'll put all that information in the, in the chat again. Okay, so um, for the, the next part, if you have a tomato with you and um, you're ready to start saving your seeds, I'm just gonna walk you through the setup. So the thing about tomatoes is that they're, they're easy to plan for, for seed saving, and then take just a little bit more attention on the seed saving end. Um, so tomatoes, you know, if, on the inside, kind of are gelatinous, they're kind of, they have the, the juices and the pulp. And the seeds themselves are covered in a, in a kind of a slimy um, little coating. And it, it's there to protect them. And what is there to protect them, and it, it needs to be removed uh, before the seeds can be planted back in the ground. Now in nature, if an animal eats a, a tomato and swallows all the seeds, that coating gets removed in the digestive tract of the animal and then comes out ready to go. Also, um, if, a, if a tomato's rotting, okay, same, same idea. It'll, it'll remove that gelatinous coating 
and, and get it ready for um, the next season when it's going to germinate. It'll just lay in the ground and then germinate. But if we're bringing our tomatoes inside, uh, then we kind of, we have to reproduce that environment to get our seeds ready uh, for next season. Um, and the great thing too about tomato seed saving is that there's no guesswork when the seeds are ready. Because the seeds are ready when the fruit's ready. <laughs> so when the fruit's ripe, the seeds are, are ready to be harvested, they're, they're mature, um, and once we get them uh, prepared and dried, then they're ready to go. Other kinds of crops, we have to wait. It's a little more guesswork um, about when to harvest the seeds. So for the purposes of the tomato, when it's ripe, the seeds are mature. I'm gonna point my camera down so you can see my table surface um, as I walk you through this. Um, this is a tomato from my garden I picked this morning. Um, it's on the smaller end. I think normally, because this, this is the second um, fruit set for this bush or this vine, I did a set of these earlier in the season with larger tomatoes. So I would pick a, typically a nice, you know, big, healthy fruit the way that you, like maybe, maybe not your favorite one because you might want to eat that one, but you know, a nice, good looking, healthy, the color it's supposed to be um, fruit to start with. Uh, and I'm going to start by, we have to extract the seeds. I'm going to point this down now. Um, so here's the, the part where the tomato was attached to the plant. And I'm just going to simply cut it open against the sort of perpendicular to where the stem was to open up the, or I'm sorry, parallel to the stem so that we can open up the, the seed chambers, just like you would slice a tomato. And then in my jar, uh, you just squeeze it all in there, the pulp, the, the juice, the, as many of the seeds as you can get out. Okay. And the more seeds, uh, you know, you don't need thousands of seeds if you're just saving them for yourself, um, for your own purposes or to share with a few friends. Uh, I like to do a lot. This is, and I would, I'm going to do from two tomatoes here. Um, just because I'm planning on returning some of these seeds to the seed library. Um, okay, just, yeah, you can get it all in there. Okay. Okay, and then you put in, you add a little water. Just a little bit. And then I always say, and I say it over and over again, because I never, well, I never was good at this before, but label, <laughs> label your jar um, with, I, I like to put the variety and then the date. So these are Constoluto tomatoes. And I use um, the little canning labels from Ball. I love these because they wash off in water and don't leave that sticky residue um, behind. So as soon as you're done, you can just rinse it off and you're ready to go for the next thing. And I put the date um, just because, you know, life gets busy and we might forget when we put these in water. And, and then this way there's no guesswork. Okay, so that's it for right now. So you just squeeze your tomatoes in there, add the water, label it, put the date if that's helpful for you. And then you set this aside. I keep my jars open to the air. You can also cover it, but you, you don't want to seal it. You want it, you want the airflow in there. You can cover it with a paper towel or if you have a cloth, like a, a thin, like tea towel, you could do that. And then this sits on your counter or wherever for one to three days. And what's happening is that the tomato and the pulp and the seed, it'll start to ferment and it'll get a little stinky and a little pungent. And then that's the process that eats away that little gelatinous coating at the end of or around the, the seeds. I have a couple here that I put in the water a few days ago. So I'll show you what they look like. And then I also have a photo from earlier this summer. So I don't know if you can even see it, but it'll start to look a little milky, a little white, a little bubbly, you know, just a little, and it'll smell fermented. Like it'll smell 
that pungent ferment, that fermented smell. And that only takes, that these are probably even a day, I probably could have emptied these out yesterday, but um, they are a day to three days and, and that's good. So once they get to that fermented state, I'm gonna move my mess. Then it's time to uh, drain and, and uh, rinse them off. So I'll, I'll just show you quickly what the ones I have here. Um, so I have a sieve and a, just a bowl and I just pour them out. Okay, and then you can run water. I don't, I'm not near my sink, so I'm not gonna do that part and just rinse and, and all that, the gelatinous and all that guck will come out. You can do it a few times if you need to, um, to make sure that your seeds are as clean as you can get them. Another way you can do it too, and this doesn't always, always work out, but in this case, if you look at this jar, most of my seeds are sitting at the bottom, and I don't think you can see really well, but because it's cloudy. And there's some floating at the top and there's sort of like the pulp. I could fill this jar up with water and pour off kind of all the stuff that's floating and then pour the rest of it into the sieve and uh, rinse them off, get them all the pulp cleaned out. And that should do it. If you feel like it's still kind of really pulpy and slimy after you've rinsed it, you could return the seeds to the jar, fill it up with water again and let them sit for another day or two. Um, and do the process a second time if you just feel like it didn't quite get all the, the stuff off. And then once they're cleaned and rinsed, um, I put mine out to dry. Here, I'm gonna point my screen down again. Um, on a plate, this is a melamine, but you can use ceramic um, or something that's not paper uh, because they will stick. So, and I put them out to dry in a single layer as best I can you know, for, I, mine have probably been up there for two weeks. You probably don't need to do it for that long, especially when it's warm like this. But I just put them on the top shelf somewhere in my room. Notice I've labeled my plate too, so I never forget which um, variety is what. And I leave them out to dry for a few weeks. Yeah, and don't put them on paper towels because they'll dry and then stick to the paper towel and the paper will stick to your seeds and it'll just, it won't be fun. Um, because they do kind of stick even to the plates. You kind of have to kind of scoop them, scoop them off. Uh, and then I store our seed, my seeds just as the library. This is one of the library seed packets in these little coin envelopes. Um, and I'll, I'll label it. I'll put the year that I uh, did the seed saving. So I know it was from 2020 uh, and, the, and the variety so that I know that I'm all set to go. And then this would just go into my um, seed storage. Uh, and be ready for the next year. If you have, if you harvested a ton of seeds and you have like a lot of extras, you could do a germination test um, where you take, you know, count out 10 or 20 seeds and uh, put them in a, a damp cloth for several days or in a, you know, very uh, shallow soil just to see, test your uh, germination. Uh, and you can see if you've got some, if you have viable seeds. If none of them germinate, then maybe there's a problem. Um, and it didn't go up so well. But the great thing is that there's always next season and you can try again, or maybe you still have tomatoes and you can do it again um, with your next fruit set. Um, okay, so that's the, the process for getting it started. So like I said, so the pre, like the growing and the planning, the only thing you need to worry about is making sure you have an open pollinated seed to start. Um, that if you want to isolate your flowers, you have the bags on hand, and then also making sure that you don't have flowers with the protracted stigma. And then the timing more comes with the, the process I just showed you. But really, it, it doesn't take a long time, and if, especially if you date your, your jars, then you know you can be like, oh yeah, it's been three days, and then you just quickly rinse them and uh, get them out to dry. So I'll pause here again before covering um, beans and uh, lettuce for questions. Jessica, we have a lot of great questions. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read them out for you so you don't have to try to monitor the chat. Okay. Um, and then you can kind of just answer as we go. So sure. the first one is, um, and this is a really great question in case people aren't growing right now. Can you begin seed saving from a store-bought tomato? 
you can try. <laughs> um, however, you don't know the origin of that tomato. You don't know if it's a hybrid. Um, you don't know. You, there's just a lot you don't know about it. Sure, you could save the seeds and, and, may, and it may work, um, but you wouldn't have any information about what it is. And if that matters to you, then yeah, it might be a problem. If, you, if it just was the most delicious tomato you ever had and you want to replicate it, go ahead and try. Um, if, if it's a hybrid uh, tomato, you may not get the same tomato that you bought in the store. That would be the only, you know, thing. And, and you just don't know that, you know, unless, unless you know the cultivar, unless you know what kind of tomato is specifically, and then you can look it up. So you could try it. it if it's not a hybrid, it would definitely have viable seeds. Great. Okay. So next question is, do these need to stay cool? Um, or is it okay if they're in a warm garage or room? Um, are there like temperature rules for sort? For the ferment fermenting part? Oh, sorry. Yeah. For the fermenting. Sorry. Okay. Um, I would not, I mean, actually if it's in the, I don't know. I don't, I just keep mine on my counter. Mine was in a sunny window for a couple of days. Like it gets a lot of morning sun and it doesn't seem to, um, affect it. On a day like today, you know, because he, extreme heat just for seeds in general isn't great. Um, and since they're going through a process, I would keep them indoors somewhere. Um, but I, I don't think there's a, like, you don't want it to freeze, you know, <laughs> and you don't, you know, I, I wouldn't put it out in extreme heat like today. But I think beyond that, you know, anything, you know, should be okay. It, they, some people think are really sensitive to the smell of the fermenting process. I doesn't, I don't really notice it unless I'm sticking my nose in it. So if it's bothersome to you, you know, put it in a room that you could close off like a laundry room or maybe on a back, a covered shaded uh, back patio. I wouldn't put it like in a sunny spot outside. Okay. And we have a couple of people asking if, um, the seeds might ever start to try to germinate in that time frame? In the water? I don't, I've never had that happen. Um, I've never seen that happen. I, I don't, I, yeah, I've never, I'm not to say that it couldn't, but I've never seen that happen. Okay, and next question is, will it work if you isolate the seeds and not have all the extra pulp? And how do you store and how many years will they last? I, I don't know if I understand the question. Um, um, will it work if you isolate the seeds and not have all the extra? Pulp? Oh, all the pulp and you just, you know, um, it, it, so for example, this, the, my other jar, this green grape um, has had a lot, cause it's a cherry tomato, had a lot less pulp than the, the Consoluto just cause it's a, you know, meteor tomato, and it still works. You'll still get the fermenting because there's still enough of that. It's the gel that that kind of slimy stuff that's around the seeds that we're really trying to attack. Um, so even the cherry tomatoes that I I've done green grapes for a few years, um, they ferment, and you know, even with a little bit of pulp in them. And then storage um, again, once your seeds are dry, and make sure they're dry because. <laughs> If they're not, they could get moldy and then that's, they're, that's done, they're done. Um, I just store mine in a closet and, you know, in paper envelopes up in, in a dark, cool, dry environment where I don't, you know, where critters can't get to them because um, mice will eat seed stalks um, if they can get to them. And was there a third part of that? Oh, how many years will they last? Um, so I think for tomatoes, you know, five to six years. We so one of the ones I am saving seeds from this year was from 2012. I pulled some old seeds from the library stock to try to grow them out to get fresher seeds, and the germination rate wasn't great. So I still got some tomato plants. So really, what happens? It's not like after five or six years the door shuts and nothing's going to germinate. It's just that the germination rate will go down. So the seeds I planted this summer from the library were eight years old. And so I just planted a lot more of them to ensure that I would get a few plants. So even if you do have old seeds and you really want, you can just try, but my recommendation is just to plant more 
um, because the germination rate will be lower. And then of course, eventually, you know, you may have zero <laughs> germination. Um, but the sooner you use them, the higher the germination rate is going to be. Okay, great. So um, we have another question about the saving process. So um, someone mentioned that they saved seeds on paper towels okay. and, and they still use them or should they toss them away? So maybe we can talk about maybe the differences between the two methods. So you dried it. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to assume that they dried them on the on paper, paper towels. towels. Yeah. So I, if you can get them off um, relatively easily, I think they should be fine. Even if there's paper stuck to them, it's not going to, because once you put the seed in the ground the next spring, you know, the paper's just going to kind of dissolve away. It's, it's more of just, you know, um, to create less frustration and it just makes it easier to dry them on a smooth, you know, surface that's not going to stick to them. Um, I saw a post one time where somebody cut, just cut the seeds, like just cut the paper towel and then yeah. just planted them. Um, yeah. It'd be like seed tape. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can make seed tape for, um, carrots and stuff where you want to put lots of little seeds in a row and they're actually stuck to newspaper. So it's not <laughs> going to hurt the seed. It's just going to make them harder to separate. Um, yeah. So something like carrots, you grow a lot of them right close together. So seed tape, you know, them being all stuck together, you know, is actually helpful. But for tomatoes, you don't want to grow six, you know, in, on the size of a quarter. So yeah, you can, if you can't get them off the paper towel, just cut it up. And, and once you plant them, that paper towel will just dissolve and go away. Uh, okay, so we have a question about fruit selection. Um, do you recommend selecting the biggest fruit? Um, do you think it's important to save seeds from multiple fruits off the plant? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, so you can, I would, yeah, I would choose a healthy fruit. I like to save seeds from more than one fr fruit on the plant, even better is if you have two of the same variety, you know, say you have two of your favorite tomato growing. We often don't, we often only have one of each variety, but the more plants you can, the more individual plants of the same variety you can save from is better too. However, tomatoes are a lot more resilient. So there are some crops that if you're only saving from one plant over and over and over again, year after year, the, the gene pool for that plant gets too small and it starts to affect the, the um, productiveness and healthiness of that plant. Tomatoes, on the other hand, are not nearly as um, susceptible to that. There's a, a genetic term for it that I can't think of right now, something like genetic depression or something like that. Um, because this is a gene pool, you know, and, but tomatoes are a lot more resilient that way. So if we're just saving from one plant, it's not gonna affect it like it would some others. However, if you have a friend or if you have a neighbor or you buddy up with somebody at the seed library and you're both growing the same, like a green grape tomato and are saving seeds, that's better. It's always better to have um, seeds from multiple plants. However, tomatoes, not as much as others. Um, yeah. I have a friend, this is an aside. She um, used to live down here and now in the Bay Area and she's, uh, has, she's uh, been saving tomatillo seeds from a variety that she's been growing and she's been selecting for color. So over the years, she's been selecting the deepest, darkest, purplest tomatillos um, and now has a seed that she's like an, her own variety and that's a deep, dark purple. And now she's working on selecting for size. So you can kind of play with it that way, like, you know, save the tomato that has the best color. And then the following year, you know, you do it, you have your plant and then again, you save the tomato with the best color or the best flavor or which, whatever trait, you know, you really desire. Um, and you can slowly move your, um, your tomato plant to your, the desire, just like farmers do, you know, just like that's how we have all these varieties is that people selected over and over again for a specific trait. So you could do it that way too. We have a couple more questions. Um, I wanted to check to see in terms of time check. Um, do you want to take these toward the end? Um, I think you said you had a little more presentation or did you want to go ahead and? I'll take a couple more. The, the next part of my presentation is very short. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, we have a follow up on the paper towel question. Uh -huh. um, so if they've already dried them, 
without soaking them first. Oh. But they're dry. Would you recommend soaking them to to ferment off that? Mm. No. And maybe would that would that cause them to start to germinate? <laughs> Is there any? Issues? Oh, that's the question. Oh, well, that's that's the, question. One. the question was: um, Should they start the process? Yeah, if they're already dry. You know what? My my thing is always you. You have nothing to lose, right? So um, I would maybe start with half. Try it with half of them. This would be a great experiment. You know, ferment like just put half of those dried seeds in the water, and uh, see if they'll ferment. There may not be enough stuff, you know, to to get it going. Um, and then keep the other half out, and then plant both and see see what happens. Um, yeah. Okay, we have one more question. Um, I have three of the green grape plants and one is on its second round of fruiting. Mm -hmm. um, are these smaller fruits going to be useful to save the seeds from or did I miss my chance with that particular plant? I think it's useful, yeah. Um, because again, you're, you're not gonna plant those seeds and only get small fruit. You'll still get a variety of sizes. That it, Danielle? Perfect. Yeah, that's it for now. Okay. All right. So I just want to quickly, because um, you may have warm seeds and lettuces that are bolting, or maybe they're already sitting blooming in your garden, um, and you may be growing beans too. And for the beginning seed saver, these two are easy ones to start. Um, they are both self pollinators um, that, uh, like the um, the tomato that don't cross easily with via insect or, or anything like that. Uh, tomato, the, the difference with these though is that the seeds um, are not mature until much later, you know, much beyond when the fruit um, is mature. So for example, I have, um, I have lettuce in my garden that went to seed. <laughs> this is a warm season romaine. And this is actually the second bloom. So it, it that when a lettuce bolts, if you've ever, you know, seen it, they start to climb really quickly from the center. Uh, and if you let it keep, and it gets bitter and it's no longer good to eat. Um, if you keep it going, they get quite tall and will put out, you know, a, a bunch of flowers that looks like, they're usually yellow, that look um, in this sort of bunch. So that happened and they bloomed and they went to seed and I snipped the, the, the plant and took all the, the seed heads off and then it sent out and then I didn't pull the plants up just because I never got around to it and and it sent up a like side shoots and I got another round of seeds from these plants this is a freckled romaine so when a lettuce is ready um, it'll bloom and then it'll have these puffs much like a dandelion um, and that's when you know and I wait like I let it these have been on here forever and the, um, the little seed heads, I'm gonna point my thing down, um, are pretty dry. So I know now that this, this lettuce is ready to harvest. The seeds are attached to the end of each one of these individual puffs. So some people will take this cluster and put a paper bag around them and hang it upside down and, and let the, the seeds fall just naturally. Um, I like to, I'm not that patient. <laughs> I just pull them out by hand. I just grab the puff and pull the seeds out. And you'll, you'll see that there's, they're probably too small for you to see. Um, here, I'll see if I can show you. Okay, and they'll, be, they'll just fall into your hand. Um, these are probably really dry um, because they've been sitting out in my garden for weeks as puffs. Um, but I still put them on a plate and let them sit again just to be sure um, and then put them again in my in the bag and label it and put the year. Um, so lettuce is easy it, because it's a self-pollinator you can just let it grow you just have to let it grow a lot longer than you might normally. Um, so when you're planning your gardens if you want to plan for seed saving um, you'll just know that some plants will have to be in there much longer and you can't pull them out and make room for something else until much later in the season. So that's just quickly on lettuce. And then I have one more slide to share with you for beans. And that's quick too. So beans, let's see. Okay. 
Oh, here's a picture of the um, the fermented tomato seed uh, after a few days, just in, so you can kind of, in case it didn't really come through over the video, the live video. So that's sort of what it looks like. You can even see on the left, the red one, there's a little bit of mold in there. So it may have been left out a day too long. I mean, the seeds are gonna be fine, but um, yeah. Okay, so for beans, um, same thing with the organza bags. You can see on the left, that's, that's the um, little twist or the little bag ties that I've marked those beans. Those beans were covered with the little, or the blossoms were covered with the organza bags before the blossoms opened. That's not, again, totally necessary, but I do it just to be sure, especially if I have a lot of different bean varieties growing at the same time. And then on the right-hand side is how dry your beans should be <laughs> before you harvest them. Um, I let the, the, the pods dry on the vine uh, before harvesting, just so I'm sure that, um, that they're, they're mature seeds. For soup beans, uh, like a pinto bean or a black bean, you would do this anyway. But for a green bean, which we normally harvest quite young, those seeds are not mature yet. So if you want to save green bean seeds, you have to let them get big and dry and let them mature on the vine uh, way past the time that you would harvest for eating. But again, you can then just shell them. And uh, it's a great activity kit. If you have young kids, they love to do this um, and uh, get them uh, separated from the pods and then you know, put them in your seed packets. One thing I will say about beans, and this happened to me once, and it actually wasn't for beans that I was saving, they were beans that I harvested for eating, is that they can get weevils, little weevil bugs that um, what happens is that the, the larva gets in there while the bean is still green. And then it, it sits in the, the egg sits in the, um, in the bean until it's big and mature and dry, and then they hatch and they eat their way out. <laughs> so uh, what happened is that I had all these beautiful dried beans and I went to go make a soup with them and they were full of bugs. And a way to make sure that doesn't happen um, is to freeze your, once you've harvested your beans, your dry beans, is to freeze them for 48 hours or so, and then thaw them out, dry, make sure they're dry and store them because that'll kill the little eggs that are in there, little larvae or eggs that are in there. Um, so yeah, it was pretty devastating. <laughs> so to do all that work and be ready to enjoy those, those beans and then have, have had something eat them before we got to them. Um, that has been, I have, I, I mean, I have saved bean seeds and not frozen them and not had that problem, but it is a possibility. So if you wanna make sure, you know, that, that that's not gonna happen, just stick them in the freezer for, about 48, 72 hours, and then pull them out and store them like you would any other seed. Um, yeah, and that's, that's it um, for the, my presentation. Let me unshare. And I'll take a few more questions. We have, ooh, it's almost 11. <laughs> sure, let me, um, I'll go, we do have a few more questions. So um, someone had mentioned that they were growing arugula um, and if you can talk a little bit about the seed saving process for arugula. Um, so arugula is, a, is insect pollinated. So, uh, and there are different kinds and arugula reseeds like crazy, like itself. So it, you would have to isolate the, the bloom if you have other arugula or other, you also, I, I'm not an expert on arugula, but if there was some wild cousin of like, you know, something variety in the area as well, that's something to keep in mind. I know like radishes, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, so you would have to, I, if you wanted to make sure you were getting the same exact variety and not a cross between this arugula and the arugula that your neighbor's growing, or maybe another, you, you, would, you would have to isolate the, the flower and then figure out how to pollinate it. But I've never tried, so I don't know what the anatomy is. If it's, you know, all in the, I'm not sure what the, the, um, the process is for arugula. Um, do you soak the seeds? Do you know? The arugula seeds? Mm -hmm. No, those would be like a lettuce where you would just let them dry on the plant um, and, and harvest them dry. Yeah. Okay, and then um, 
an, an admin question. So people are just wondering again for this um, session if it'll be uh, hosted later. Yeah, we're, we're working on getting um, a platform to uh, post these uh, videos. Yeah. Okay, um, another question. So uh, I have some bolted lettuce with seeds, but haven't gotten around to getting the seeds out. They've been out in a shaded part of the yard for a few months. Are they still viable? Yeah. Yeah, they should be fine. Um, I mean, think about how long we, because we, in nature, I always think about like in nature, those seeds are going to eventually drop and they never come inside, right? So they'll probably, it's just like sitting in a seed packet, except this time it's sitting on the plant. Um, so for the dry seeds, yeah, they, they, I don't think there's a too long that they, because, you know, they've been sitting on the plant because once they're dry, they're dry. And then they're sort of, they're, they're not going to change unless there's like a heavy rain or, you know, something or fire that takes them out. But um, yeah, you could go ahead and harvest those. Uh, these that I, I picked these this morning, they've been out there for a month uh, in the sun. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have a question about, um, are people planting um, tomato seeds right now? Uh, it's, it's late in this, it would be too late in the season to, to plant um, tomato seeds. They need a long, warm, you know, season to get going and then to produce fruit. And then once it gets below a certain temperature, they won't blossom. So tomatoes kind of are finicky that way. They, if it gets too hot, they won't bloom. And if it's too cold, they won't bloom. If you have an established plant, um, some people can, especially cherry tomatoes will overwinter. Um, it'll just take a lot longer for um, the fruit to ripen because it's really heat dependent. Um, and, and, and the skins might be tougher, but now is not the time to start a tomato. I even put some in from transplants um, late in the summer and they're not going to get very big. You know, it's just going to, it's going to peter out. The season's going to peter out too soon for them to reach their full potential. I start my tomato seeds indoors um, in January um, in like a greenhouse. Well, I have a little greenhouse um, or you can, but then you can, you know, January through April, May even, you know, it's kind of our, our tomato. May would be definitely on the late end um, to plant tomato seeds. Okay, and then um, Sue's asking if um, you can overwinter tomatoes like peppers. Some, yeah, I think, I mean, it, 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 it'll really slow down. Production will really slow down. I've seen it happen mostly with cherry tomatoes. Um, I, t I personally don't do it because I need the room for something else and I don't find it, the return to be great. <laughs> um, so I just pull them out. But yes, some will, unless we have a hard freeze or something that would take out the plant. Um, how, would our, you, how would you do that? Um... To, to actually overwinter it. We just leave it there. I mean, it just, yeah. I mean, I guess in the case, if you really wanted to protect it, if it was gonna get cold below freezing, you could put a little row cover over it, just like a little blanket um, to protect it from the cold. Um, but most, uh, yeah, you just leave it. And our, we have such a you know mild winter compared to most other places in the country that it just, it kind of hangs on. As long as we don't get a big freeze. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I know we're at time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the resource links. Okay. To the chat, if you wanna um, let everyone know specifically what the resource links are. And then um, we did have one question about upcoming sessions. Like, are we gonna do sessions on germination? So maybe also um, we can touch base on what the next meetings will be if we know what those topics are. But I'll go ahead and drop those links in now if you want to sure. uh, point people to any of these resources. Okay, so as she puts those in, great. So if you are interested, even if you're not near or local, if you're interested in being on our mailing list and would like to you know, join other virtual meetings, um, just send an email to the email address in the chat, letting us know you'd like to be on the ma mailing list and we can add you. If you wanna become a member, there's a link there too um, for our online membership form, or you can email us and ask for it. Um, I can send it to you. Um, also, if you want to sign the learning, the learning garden petition, um, I will say that change.org, you know, makes a pitch for donation after you've signed their petitions and it's not 
that's for change.org. That is not for the learning garden. And sometimes the, the language is a little, it's not clear. <laughs> so just know that if you're donating, it's to change.org and not the learning garden and not the seed library. Um, and next month, for our October meeting, October 3rd, Yvonne Savio is gonna be back. She did a seed saving workshop for us last summer, and she is gonna be talking about fall and winter gardening for Southern California. So this, if you live outside of our area, it may not be as relevant to you, but she is amazing. She is like a wealth of information. Um, she's a longtime master gardener. She's been uh, gardening in Pasadena for ages and just um, is a wonderful resource. So um, even if you're not local to Southern California, you'll probably learn something from her every time I listen to her or read one of her blog posts, I'm learning something new. Um, so that's for October and November. The School Garden Foundation, I believe that's the, I don't have it on hand, is if that's the name. Um, oh, October 3rd for Yvonne. We'll send out, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be promoting as well. And then in November, we have, um, the School Garden Foundation doing a presentation on uh, growing from food scraps. So uh, that like, you know, using your carrot tops and your onions and stuff uh, to start uh, things from your, from your um, refrigerator. <laughs> so that's November and then beyond that, we don't, we don't have anything confirmed. And um, oh, one last thing for our members that are still here. I ran out of time to kind of go into depth, but um, we are going to be starting a little project um, with our membership to um, help people along the seed saving process. And we're going to be focusing on lettuce and peas for the uh, fall and winter um, to encourage our membership to um, grow and then go through the process of saving seeds for those plants to return to the library. We know that seed saving can feel complicated or just it's the unknown or we don't have time and we want to make it easier for you and we want to create a community where we can support each other in the seed saving process. We're all learning. Um, I learn every day, <laughs> you know, um, and I'm sure I have stuff to learn from you. So um, that will be coming out, that information will be coming out in our email with our next uh, seed checkout um, in, for September. And I think with that, um, I think we will close it. And thank you all for coming. This was really exciting for me. Um, and I'm hoping that we can keep um, offering uh, topics and presentations that are useful for you. And yes, we'll be sending out a form too. We normally do this in, during our meetings. Um, we'll, we'll come up with an electronic form to poll our membership and people about what is most useful in terms of presentation topics going forward, especially as we do this kind of virtual format. So with that, thank you everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email them to the Slola at Gmail uh, account and I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. And with that, everybody stay cool if you're in Southern California and have a great uh, long weekend. <laughs>